Chapter 140 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Doctor. A certain poor man named Chang, who lived at A fell in one day with a taoist priest the latter was highly skilled in the science of physiognomy and after looking at chang's features said to him you would make your fortune as a doctor alas replied chang i can barely read and write how then could i follow such a calling as that and where you simple fellow asked the priest is the necessity for a doctor to be a scholar you just try that's all Thereupon Chang returned home, and, being very poor, he simply collected a few of the commonest prescriptions, and set up a small stall, with a handful of fish's teeth and some dry honeycomb, for a wasp's nest, hoping thus to earn, by his tongue, enough to keep body and soul together, to which, however, no one paid any particular attention. Now it chanced that just then the governor of Ching Chow was suffering from a bad cough, and had given orders to his subordinates to send to him the most skilful doctors in their respective districts, and the magistrate of I, who was an out-of-the-way mountainous district, being unable to lay his hands on any one whom he could send in, gave orders to the beadle to do the best he could under the circumstances. Accordingly, Chang was nominated by the people, and the magistrate put his name down to go in to the governor. When Chang heard of his appointment, he happened to be suffering himself, from a bad attack of bronchitis, which he was quite unable to cure, and he begged, therefore, to be excused. But the magistrate would not hear of this, and forwarded him at once in charge of some constables. While crossing the hills, he became very thirsty, and went into a village to ask for a drink of water. But water there was worth its weight in yade, and no one would give him any. By and by, he saw an old woman washing a quantity of vegetables in a scanty supply of water which was consequently very thick and muddy and being unable to bear his thirst any longer he obtained this and drank it up shortly afterwards he found that his cough was quite cured and then it occurred to him that he had hit upon a capital remedy when he reached the city he learned that a great many doctors had already tried their hand upon the patient but without success so asking for a private room in which to prepare his medicine he obtained from the town some bunches of bishop ward and proceeded to wash them, as the old woman had done. He then took the dirty water, and gave a dose of it to the governor, who was immediately and permanently relieved. The patient was overjoyed, and, besides making Chan a handsome present, gave him a certificate written in golden characters, in consequence of which his fame spread far and wide, and of the numerous cases he subsequently undertook, in not a single instance did he fail to effect a cure one day however a patient came to him complaining of a violent chill chang who happened to be tipsy at the time treated him by mistake for remittent fever when he got sober he became aware of what he had done but he said nothing to anybody about it and three days afterwards the same patient waited upon him with all kinds of presents to thank him for a rapid recovery such cases as this were by no means rare with him and soon he got so rich that he would not attend when summoned to visit a sick person, unless the summons was accompanied by a heavy fee and a comfortable chair to ride in. End of chapter 140。Chapter 141 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Fu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Snow in Summer On the sixth day of the seventh moon of the year Ting Hai, 1647, there was a heavy fall of snow at Su Chao. The people were in a great state of consternation at this, and went off to the temple of the great prince to pray. Then the spirit moved one of them to say, 
you now address me as your honor. Make it your excellency, and, though I am but a lesser deity, it may well be worth your while to do so. Thereupon the people began to use the latter term, and the snow stopped at once, from which I infer that flattery is just as pleasant to divine as to mortal ears. End of chapter 141「Chapter 142 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio」Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio Volume 2 by Sang Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Blanchet At Cheng Sheng They lived a man named Wang Ju Ting, who understood the art of planchet. He called himself a disciple of Liu Tung Pin, and someone said he was probably that worthy crane. At his seances, the subjects were always literary, essays, poetry, and so on. The well-known scholar Li Qi thought very highly of him, and availed himself of his aid on more than one occasion, so that by degrees the literati generally also patronized him. His responses to questions of doubt or difficulty were remarkable for their reasonableness. Matters of mere good or bad fortune he did not care to enter into. In 1631, just after the examination at Chi Nan, a number of the candidates requested Mr. Wong to tell them how they would stand on the list, and after having examined their essays, he proceeded to pass his opinion on their merits. Among the rest, there happened to be one who was very intimate with another candidate, not present, whose name was Le Ping, and who, being an enthusiastic student and a deep thinker, was confidently expected to appear among the successful few. Accordingly, the friend submitted Mr. Li's essay for inspection, and in a few minutes, two characters appeared on the sand, namely, number one. After a short interval, this sentence followed. The decision given just now had a reference to Mr. Li's essay simply as an essay. Mr. Li's destiny is darkly obscured, and he will suffer accordingly. It is strange, indeed, that a man's literary powers and his destiny should thus be out of harmony. Surely the examiner will judge of him by his essay. But stay, I will go and see how matters stand. Another pause ensued, and then these words were written down. I have been over to the examiner's yamen, and have found a pretty state of things going on. Instead of reading the candidate's papers himself, he has handed them over to his clerks, some half-dozen illiterate fellows who purchased their own degrees, and who, in their previous existence, had no status whatever. Hungry devils, begging their bread in all directions, and who, after eight hundred years passed in the murky gloom of the infernal regions, have lost all discrimination, like men, long buried in a cave, and suddenly transferred to the light of day. Among them may be one or two, who have risen above their former selves, but the odds are against an essay falling into the hands of one of these. The young man 
then begged to know if there was any method by which such an evil might be counteracted, to which the planchette replied that there was, but, as it was universally understood, there was no occasion for asking the question. Thereupon they went off and told Mr. Lee, who was so much distressed at the prediction that he submitted his essay to His Excellency, Sang Tzu Mei, one of the finest scholars of the day. This gentleman examined it and was so pleased with its literary merit that he told Li he was quite sure to pass and the latter thought no more about the planchet prophecy. However, when the list came out, there he was down in the fourth class, and this so much disconcerted His Excellency Mr. Sun that he went carefully through the essay again for fear lest any blemishes might have escaped his attention. Then he cried out, Well, I have always thought this examiner to be a scholar. He can never have made such a mistake as this. It must be the fault of some of his drunken assistants who don't know the mere rudiments of composition. This fulfillment of the prophecy raised Mr. Wong very high in the estimation of the candidates, who forthwith went and burned incense and invoked the spirit of the planchet, which at once replied in the following terms, Let not Mr. Li be disheartened by temporary failure. Let him rather strive to improve himself still further, and next year he may be among the first on the list. Li carried out these injunctions, and after a time the story reached the ears of the examiner, who gratified Li by making a public acknowledgment that there had been some miscarriage of justice at the examination, and the following year he was passed high up on the list. End of chapter 142、Chapter、143 Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Friendship with Foxes. A certain man had an enormous stack of straw, as big as a hill, in which his servants, taking what was daily required for use, had made quite a hole. In this hole, a fox fixed his abode. And would often shew himself to the master of the house under the form of an old man. One day, the latter invited the master to walk into the cave, which he at first declined, but accepted on being pressed by the fox. And when he got inside, lo, he saw a long suite of handsome apartments. They then sat down and exquisitely perfumed tea and wine were brought, but the place was so gloomy that there was no difference between night and day. By and by, the entertainment being over, the guest took his leave, and on looking back, the beautiful rooms in their contents. Had all disappeared. The old man himself was in the habit of going away in the evening and returning with the first streaks of morning. And as no one was able to follow him, the master of the house asked him one day whither he went. To this he replied that a friend invited him 
to take wine, and then the master begged to be allowed to accompany him, a proposal to which the old man very reluctantly consented. However, he seized the master by the arm, and away they went as though riding on the wings of the wind. And in about the time it takes to cook a pot of millet, they reached a city and walked into a restaurant where there were a number of people drinking together and making a great noise. The old man led his companion to a gallery above, from which they could look down on the feasters below, and he himself went down and brought away from the tables all kinds of nice food and wine without appearing to be seen or noticed by any of the company. After a while, a man dressed in red garments came forward and laid upon the table some dishes of kumquats, and the master at once requested the old man to go down and get him some of these. Ah, replied the latter, that is an upright man. I cannot approach him. Thereupon the master said to himself, By thus seeking the companionship of a fox, I then am deflected from the true course. Henceforth I too will be an upright man. No sooner had he formed this resolution, than he suddenly lost all control over his body, and fell from the gallery down among the revellers below. These gentlemen were much astonished by his unexpected descent, and he himself, looking up, saw there was no gallery to the house, but only a large beam upon which he had been sitting. He now detailed the whole of the circumstances, and those present made up a purse for him to pay his travelling expenses, for he was at Utai, one thousand li from home. End of chapter 143「Chapter 144 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chuck Williamson, Columbus, Ohio. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. To 1935. Chapter 144 The Great Rat During the reign of Emperor Wan Li, footnote, A.D. 1573-1620, the epoch of the most celebrated Blue China, end footnote, the palace was troubled by the presence of a huge rat, quite as big as a cat, which ate up all the cats that were set to catch it. Just then it chanced that among the tribute offerings sent by some foreign state was a lion cat, as white as snow. This cat was accordingly put into the room where the rat usually appeared, and, the door being closely shut, a secret watch was kept. By and by the rat came out of its hole, and rushed at the cat, which turned and fled, finally jumping on the table. The rat followed, upon which the cat jumped down, and thus they went on up and down for some time. Those who were watching said the cat was afraid and of no use. However, in a little while, the rat began to jump less briskly, and soon after squatted down out of breath. Then the cat rushed at it, 
and seizing the rat by the back of the neck, shook and shook while its victim squeaked and squeaked until life was extinct. Thus they knew the cat was not afraid, but merely waited for its adversary to be fatigued, fleeing when pursued, and itself pursuing the fleeing rat. Truly many a bad swordsman may be compared with that rat. End of chapter 144「Chapter 145 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to 1935. Chapter 145. Wolves. 1. A certain village butcher who had bought some meat at market and was returning home in the evening, suddenly came across a wolf, which followed him closely, its mouth watering at the sight of what he was carrying. The butcher drew his knife and drove the animal off, and then, reflecting that his meat was the attraction, he determined to hang it up in a tree and fetch it the next morning. This he accordingly did, and the wolf followed him no further. But when he went at daylight to recover his property, he saw something hanging up in the tree resembling a human corpse. It turned out to be the wolf, which, in its efforts to get at the meat, had been caught on the meat hook like a fish. And, as the skin of a wolf was just then worth ten ounces of silver, the butcher found himself possessed of quite a little capital. Here we have a laughable instance of the result of climbing trees to catch fish. 2. A butcher, while traveling along at night, was sore pressed by a wolf, and took refuge in an old mat shed which had been put up for the watchman of the crops. There he lay, while the wolf sniffed at him from outside, and at length thrust in one of its paws from underneath. This the butcher seized hold of at once, and held it firmly so that the wolf couldn't stir. And then, having no other weapon at hand, he took a small knife he had with him and slit the skin underneath the wolf's paw. He now proceeded to blow into it, as butchers blow into pork, and after vigorously blowing for some time, he found that the wolf had ceased to struggle, upon which he went outside and saw the animal lying on the ground, swelled up to the size of a cow and unable to bend its legs or close its open mouth. Thereupon, he threw it across his shoulders and carried it off home. However, such a feat as this could only be accomplished by a butcher. End of chapter 145「Chapter 146 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio » Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio. Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. Singular Verdict. A servant in the employ of a Mr. Sun was sleeping alone one night when all in a sudden he was arrested and carried before the tribunal of the ruler of purgatory. This is not the right man, cried his majesty, and immediately sent him back. However, after this, the servant was afraid to sleep on that bed again, and took up his quarters elsewhere. But another servant, named Kyo Yang, seeing the vacant place, went and occupied it. A third servant, named Li Lu, who had an old standing grudge against the first, stole up to the bed that same night, with a knife in his hand, and killed Kyu Nang in mistake for his enemy. Kyu's father at once brought the case before the magistrate of the place, pleading that the murdered man was his only son, on whom he depended for his living, and the magistrate decided that Kyu was to take Li Lu in the place of his dead son. Much to the discomfiture of the old man, truly the descent of a first servant into purgatory 
was not so marvellous as to magistrate's decision. End of chapter 146「Chapter 147 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 147. The Grateful Dog. A certain trader, who had been doing business at Wu Hu, and was returning home with the large profits he had made, saw on the river bank a butcher tying up a dog. He bought the animal for much more than its value, and carried it along with him in his boat. Now the boatman had formerly been a bandit, and, tempted by his passenger's wealth, ran the boat among the rushes, and drawing a knife prepared to slay him. The trader begged the man to leave him a whole skin, so the boatman wrapped him up in a carpet and threw him into the river. The dog, on seeing what was done, whined piteously, and, jumping into the river, seized the bundle with his teeth, and did its best to keep the trader above water, until at length a shallow spot was reached. The animal then succeeded by continuous barking, and attracting the attention of some people on the bank, and they hauled the bundle out of the river, and released the trader who was still alive. The latter asked to be taken back to Wu Hu, where he might look out for the robber boatman. But just as he was about to start, lo, the dog was missing. The trader was much distressed at this, and after spending some days at Wu Hu, without being able to find, among the forest of masts collected there, the particular boat he wanted. He was on the point of returning home with a friend, when suddenly the dog reappeared, and seemed by its barking to invite its master to follow in a certain direction. This the trader did, until at length the dog jumped on a boat and seized one of the boatmen by the leg. No beating could make the animal let go, and on looking closely at the man, the trader saw that he was the identical boatman who had robbed and tried to murder him. He had changed his clothes and also his boat, so that at first he was not recognizable. He was now, however, arrested, and the whole of the money was found in his boat. To think that a dog could show gratitude like that, truly there are not a few persons who would be put to shame by that faithful animal. End of chapter 147 Chapter 148 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. The Great Test. Before Mr. Yang Ta Hang was known to fame, he had already acquired some reputation as a scholar in his own part of the country, and felt convinced himself that his was to be no mean destiny. When the list of successful candidates at the examination was brought to where he lived, he was in the middle of dinner and rushed out with his mouth full to ask if his name was there or not, and on hearing that it was not, he experienced such a revulsion of feeling that what he then swallowed stuck fast like a lump in his chest and made him very ill. His friends tried to appease him by advising him to try at the further examination of the rejected, and when he urged that he had no money, they subscribed ten ounces of silver and started him on his way. That night he dreamt that a man appeared to him and said, Ahead of you there is one who can cure your complaint. Beseech him to aid you. 
the man then added, A tune on the flute, neath the riverside willow, Oh, show no regret, when tis cast to the billow. Next day, Mr. Young actually met a Taoist priest, sitting beneath a willow tree, and making him a bow, asked him to prescribe for his malady. You have come to the wrong person, replied the priest, smiling. I cannot cure diseases, but had you asked me for a tune on the flute, I could have possibly helped you. Then Mr. Yang knew that his dream was being fulfilled, and going down on his knees, offered the priest all the money he had. The priest took it, but immediately threw it into the river, at which Mr. Yang, thinking how hardly he had come by this money, was moved to express his regret. Aha! cried the priest at this. So you are not indifferent, eh? You'll find your money all safe on the bank. There indeed Mr. Young found it, at which he was so much astonished that he addressed the priest as though he had been an angel. I am no angel, said the priest, but here comes one. Whereupon Mr. Young looked behind him, and the priest seized the opportunity to give him a slap on the back, crying out at the same time, You worldly-minded fellow! This blow brought up the lump of food that had stuck in his chest, and he felt better at once. But when he looked round, the priest had disappeared. End of chapter 148《Chapter 149 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles.》The Alchemist At Chengnang there lived a scholar named Chia Tzu Long, who one day noticed a very refined-looking stranger, and on making inquiries about him, learned that he was a Mr. Chen, who had taken lodgings hard by. Accordingly, next day, Chia called and sent in his card, but did not see Chen, who happened to be out at the time. The same thing occurred thrice, and at length Chia engaged someone to watch and let him know when Mr. Chen was at home. However, even then the latter would not come forth to receive his guest, and Chia had to go in and rout him out. The two now entered into a conversation, and soon became mutually charmed with each other, and by and by Chia sent off a servant to bring wine from a neighbouring wine shop. Mr. Chen proved himself a pleasant boon companion, and when the wine was nearly finished, he went to a box and took from it some wine cups and a large and beautiful jade tankard, into the latter of which he poured a single cup of wine, and lo, it was filled to the brim. They then proceeded to help themselves from the tankard, but however much they took out, the contents never seemed to diminish. Chia was astonished at this, and begged Mr. Chen to tell him how it was done. Ah, replied Mr. Chen, I tried to avoid making your acquaintance solely because of your one bad quality, avarice. The art I practice is a secret known to the immortals only. How can I divulge it to you? You do me wrong, rejoined Chia, in thus attributing avarice to me. The avaricious, indeed, are always poor. Mr. Chen laughed, and they separated for that day. 
but from that time they were constantly together, and all ceremony was laid aside between them. Whenever Chia wanted money, Mr. Chen would bring out a black stone, and muttering a charm, would rub it on a tile or brick, which was forthwith changed into a lump of silver. This silver he would give to Chia, and it was always just as much as he actually required, neither more nor less. And if ever the latter asked for more, Mr. Chen would rally him on the subject of avarice. Finally, Chia determined to try and get possession of this stone, and one day, when Mr. Chen was slipping off the fumes of a drinking bout, he tried to extract it from his clothes. However, Chen detected him at once and declared that they could be friends no more, and the next day he left the place altogether. About a year afterwards, Chia was one day wandering by the river bank when he saw a handsome looking stone, marvelously like that in the possession of Mr. Chen and he picked it up at once and carried it home with him. A few days passed away, and suddenly Mr. Chen presented himself at Chia's house and explained that the stone in question possessed the property of changing anything into gold and had been bestowed upon him long before by a certain Taoist priest whom he had followed as a disciple. Alas, added he, I got tipsy and lost it, but a divination told me where it was, and if you will now restore it to me, I shall take care to repair your kindness. You have divined rightly, replied Chia, the stone is with me, but recollect, if you please, that the indigent Quan Chang shared the wealth of his friend Pao Shu. At this hint, Mr. Chen said he would give Chia 100 ounces of silver, to which the latter replied that 100 ounces was a fair offer, but that he would far sooner have Mr. Chen teach him the formula to utter when rubbing the stone on anything, so as just to try the thing once himself. Mr. Chen was afraid to do this, whereupon Chia cried out, you are an immortal yourself. You must know well enough that I would never deceive a friend. So Mr. Chen was prevailed upon to teach him the formula, and then Chia would have tried the art upon the immense stone washing block which was lying near at hand, had not Mr. Chen seized his arm and begged him not to do anything so outrageous. Chia then picked up half a brick and laid it on the washing block, saying to Mr. Chen, This little piece is not too much, surely? Accordingly, Mr. Chen relaxed his hold and let Chia proceed, which he did by promptly ignoring the half brick and quickly rubbing the stone on the washing block. Mr. Chen turned pale when he saw him do this, and made a dash forward to get hold of the stone. But it was too late. The washing block was already a solid mass of silver, and Chia quietly handed him back the stone. Alas, alas, cried Mr. Chen in despair, what is to be done now? For having thus irregularly conferred wealth upon a mortal, heaven will surely punish me. Oh, if you would save me, give away one hundred coffins and one hundred suits of watered clothes. My friend, replied Chia, my object in getting money was not to hoard it up like a miser. Mr. Chen was delighted at this, and during the next three years, Chia engaged in trade, taking care to be all the time fulfilling his promise to Mr. Chen. At the expiration of that time, Mr. Chen himself reappeared, and grasping Chia's hand, said to him, 
trustworthy and noble friend. When we last parted, the spirit of happiness impeached me before God, and my name was erased from the list of angels. But now that you have carried out my request, that sentence has accordingly been rescinded. Go on as you have begun, without ceasing. Chia asked Mr. Chen what office he filled in heaven, to which the latter replied that he was only a fox who, by a sinless life, had finally attained to that clear perception of the truth which leads to immortality. Wine was then brought, and the two friends enjoyed themselves together as of old, and even when Chia had passed the age of ninety years, that fox still used to visit him from time to time. End of chapter 149「Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio」Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Raising the Dead Mr. Tang Ping who took the highest degree in the year 1661, was suffering from a protracted illness, when suddenly he felt, as it were, a warm glow rising from his extremities upwards. By the time it had reached his knees, his feet were perfectly numb and without sensation, and before long his knees and the lower part of his body were similarly affected. Gradually, this glow worked its way up until it attacked the heart, and then some painful moments ensued. Every single incident of Mr. Tang's life, from his boyhood upwards, no matter how trivial, seemed to surge through his mind, borne along on the tide of his heart's blood. At the revival of any virtuous act of his, he experienced a delicious feeling of peace and calm, but when any weak deed passed before his mind, a painful disturbance took place within him, like oil boiling and fretting in a cauldron. He was quite unable to describe the pangs he suffered, however, he mentioned that he could recollect having stolen, when only seven or eight years old, some young birds from their nest, and having killed them, and for this alone, he said, boiling blood rushed through his heart during the space of an ordinary meal time. Then when all the acts of his life had passed one after another in panorama before him, the warm glow proceeded up his throat, and entering the brain, issued out at the top of his head like smoke from a chimney. By and by, Mr. Tang's soul escaped from his body by the same aperture, and wandered far away, forgetting all about the tenant it had left behind. Just at that moment, a huge giant came along, and seizing the soul, thrust it into his sleeve, where it remained cramped and confined, huddled up with a crowd of others, until existence was almost unbearable. Suddenly, Mr. Tang reflected that Buddha alone could save him from this horrible state, and forthwith he began to call upon his holy name. At the third or fourth invocation, he fell out of the giant's sleeve, whereupon the latter picked him up and put him back. But this happened several times, and at length the giant, wearied of picking him up, let him lie where he was. The soul lay there for some time, not knowing in which direction to proceed. However, it soon recollected that the land of Buddha was in the west, 
and westwards, accordingly it began to shape its course. In a little while, the soul came upon a Buddhist priest, sitting by the roadside and hastening forwards, respectfully inquired of him which was the right way. The record of life and death for scholars, replied the priest, is in the hands of Wing Chang and Confucius. Any application must receive the consent of both. The priest then directed Mr. Tang on his way, and the latter journeyed along until he reached the Confucian temple, in which the sage was sitting with his face to the south. On hearing his business, Confucius referred him on to Wing Cheng, and, proceeding onwards, in the direction indicated, Mr. Tang by and by arrived at what seemed to be the palace of a king, within which said Wing Cheng, precisely as we depict him on earth. You are an upright man, replied the god, in a reply to Mr. Tang's prayer, and are certainly entitled to a longer span of life. But by this time, your mortal body has become decomposed, and unless you can secure the assistance of Pusa, I can give you no aid. So Mr. Tang set off once more, and hurried along until he came to a magnificent shrine standing in a thick grove of tall bamboos, and entering in, he stood in the presence of the god, on whose head was the Ashnisha, whose golden face was round like the full moon, and at whose side was a green willow branch bending gracefully over the lip of a vase. Humbly, Mr. Tang prostrated himself on the ground, and repeated what Wang Cheng had said to him, but Pu Sa seemed to think it would be impossible to grant his request, until one of the Lohans who stood by cried out, O oh God, thou canst perform this miracle, take earth and make his flesh, take a speck of willow and make his bones. Thereupon Pu Sa broke off a piece from the willow branch in the waist beside him, and pouring a little of the water upon the ground, he made clay, and casting the whole over Mr. Tang's soul, bade an attendant lead the body back to the place where his coffin was. At that instant, Mr. Tang's family heard a groan proceeding from within his coffin, and on rushing to it, and helping out the lately diseased man, they found he had quite recovered. He had then been dead seven days. End of chapter 150《Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio》Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio》Volume Two by Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Feng Shu. At Ai Chou, there lived a high official named Sang. Whose family were all ardent supporters of Feng Shu, so much so that even the woman folk read books on the subject and understood the principles of the science. When Mr. Sang died, his two sons set up separate establishments, and each invited to his own house geomancers from far and near who had any reputation in their art. To select a spot for the dead man's grave. By degrees, they had collected together as many as a hundred apiece, and every day they would scour the country round, each at the head of his own particular regiment. After about a month of this work, 
both sides had fixed upon a suitable position for the grave, and the geomancers, engaged by one brother, declared that if their spot was selected, he would certainly some day be made a marquis, while the other brother was similarly informed by his geomancers that by adopting their choice he would infallibly rise to the rank of secretary of state. Thus, neither brother would give way to the other, but each set about making the grave in his own particular place, pitching marquees and arranging banners and making all necessary preparations for the funeral. Then, when the coffin arrived at a point where roads branched off to the two graves, the two brothers, each leading on his own little army of geomancers, bore down upon it with a view to gaining possession of the corpse. From morn till due eve the battle raged, and as neither gained any advantage over the other, the mourners and friends, who had come to witness the ceremony of burial, stole away one by one, and the coolies, who were carrying the coffin, after changing the poles from one shoulder to another, until they were quite worn out, put the body down by the roadside and went off home. It then became necessary to make some protection for the coffin against the wind and rain, whereupon the elder brother immediately set about building a hut close by, in which he proposed leaving some of his attendants to keep guard. But he had no sooner begun than the younger brother followed his example, and when the elder built a second and third, the younger also built a second and third, and as this went on for a space of three whole years, by the end of that time the place had become quite a little village. By and by both brothers died, one directly after the other, and then their two wives determined to cast to the winds the decision of each party of geomancers. Accordingly, they went together to the two spots in question, and after inspecting them carefully, declared that neither was suitable. The next step was to jointly engage another set of geomancers, who submitted for their approval several different spots, and ten days had hardly passed away before the two women had agreed upon the position for their father-in-law's grave, which, as the wife of the younger brother prophesied, would surely give to the family a high military degree. So the body was buried, and within three years, Mr. Sun's eldest grandson, who had entered as a military cadet, actually took the corresponding degree to a literary master of arts. End of chapter 151「1 Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio」Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles 1845-1935 Chapter 152 The Lingering Death There was a man in our village who led an exceedingly disreputable life. One morning, when he got up rather early, two men appeared and led him away to the marketplace, where he saw a butcher hanging up half a pig. As they approached, the two men shoved him with all their might against the dead animal, and lo, his own flesh began to blend with the pork before him, while his conductors hurried off in an opposite direction. By and by, the butcher wanted to sell a piece of his meat, and seizing a knife, began to cut off the quantity required. At every touch of the blade, a disreputable friend experienced a severe pang, which penetrated into his very marrow, and when at length an old man came and haggled over the weight given him, crying out for a little bit more fat, 
or an extra portion of lean. Then, as the butcher sliced away the pork, ounce by ounce, the pain was unendurable in the extreme. By about nine o'clock the pork was all sold, and our hero went home, whereupon his family asked him what he meant by staying in bed so late. He then narrated all that had taken place, and on making inquiries they found that the pork butcher had only just come home, besides which our friend was able to tell him every pound of meat he had sold, and every slice he had cut off. Fancy! a man being put to the lingering death like this before breakfast. End of chapter 152Chapter 153 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 153 Dreaming Honors. Wang Sunong was a Tong Chao man, and a scholar of some repute but unfortunate at the public examinations. On one occasion, after having been up for his master's degree, his anxiety was very great, and when the time for the publication of the list drew near, he drank himself gloriously tipsy and went and lay down on the bed. In a few moments a man rushed in and cried out, Sir, you have passed! Whereupon Wang jumped up and said, Give him ten strings of cash! Wang's wife, seeing he was drunk, and wishing to keep him quiet, replied, You go on sleeping. I've given him the money. So Wang lay down again. But before long in came another man who informed Wang that his name was among the successful candidates for the highest degree. Why, I haven't been up for it yet, said Wang. How can I have passed? What? You don't mean to say that you have forgotten the examination? answered the man. And then Wang got up once more and gave orders to present the informant with ten strings of cash. All right, replied his wife, you go on sleeping, I've given him the money. Another short interval, and in burst a third messenger to say that Wang had been elected a member of the National Academy, and that two official servants had come to escort him thither. Sure enough, there were the two servants bowing at the bedside, and accordingly Wang directed that they should be served with wine and meat, which his wife, smiling at his drunken nonsense, declared had been already done. Wang now bethought him that he should go out and receive the congratulations of the neighbors, and wore it out several times to his official servants, but without receiving any answer. Go to sleep, said his wife, and wait till I have fetched them, and after a while the servants actually came in, whereupon Wang stamped and swore at them for being such idiots as to go away. What, you wretched scoundrel, cried the servants, are you cursing us in earnest, when we are only joking with you? At this Wang's rage knew no bounds, and he sat upon the men, and gave them a sound beating, knocking the hat of one of them off onto the ground. In the Malay he himself tumbled over, and his wife ran in to pick him up, saying, Shame upon you for getting so drunk as this! I was only punishing the servants as they deserved, replied Wang. Why do you call me drunk? Do you mean the old woman who cooks our rice and boils the water for your foot-bath? asked his wife, smiling that you talk of servants to wait upon your poverty-stricken carcass? At this sally all the women burst out in a roar of laughter, and Wang, who was just beginning to get sober, waked up as if from a dream, and knew that there was no reality in all that had taken place. However, he recollected the spot where the servant's hat had fallen off, and on going thither to look for it, lo, he beheld a tiny official hat, no larger than a wine-cup, lying there behind the door, they were all much astonished at this, and Wang himself cried out, Formerly people were thus tricked by devils, and now foxes are playing the fool with me. End of chapter 153 Recording by Todd Chapter 154 Of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. The She-Wolf and the Herd Boys Two herd boys went up among the hills and found a wolf's lair, with two little wolves in it. 
seizing each of them one. They forthwith climbed two trees which stood there. The old wolf came back, and, finding her cubs gone, was in a great state of distress. Just then, one of the herd boys pinched his cub and made it squeak, whereupon the mother ran angrily towards the tree whence the sound proceeded, and tried to climb up it. At this juncture, the boy in the other tree pinched the other cub, and thereby diverted the wolf's attention in that direction. But no sooner had she reached the foot of the second tree, than that the boy who had first pinched his cup did so again, and ran away. And away ran the old wolf, back to the tree in which her other young one was. Thus they went on, time after time, until the mother was dead tired, and lay down exhausted on the ground. Then, when after some time she shewed no signs of moving, the herd boys crept stealthily down, and found that the wolf was already stiff and cold. And truly, it is better to meet a blustering foe with his hand upon his sword hilt, by retiring within doors, and leaving him to fret his violence away unopposed. For such is but the behavior of brute beasts, of which men thus take advantage. End of chapter 154Chapter 155 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 155 Adulteration Punished. At Xin Ling there lived a seller of spirits, who was in the habit of adulterating his liquor with water and a certain drug the effect of which was that even a few cups would make the strongest-headed man as drunk as a jellyfish. Thus his shop acquired a reputation for having a good article on sale, and by degrees he became a rich man. One morning, on getting up, he found a fox lying drunk alongside of the spirit vat, and tying its legs together, he was about to fetch a knife, when suddenly the fox waked up and began pleading for its life, promising in return to do anything the spirit merchant might require. The latter then released the animal, which instantly changed into the form of a human being. Now, at that very time, the wife of a neighbor was suffering under fox influence, and this recently transformed animal confessed to the spirit master that it was he who had been troubling her. Thereupon the spirit master, who knew the lady in question to be a celebrated beauty, begged his fox friend to secretly introduce him to her. After raising some objections, the fox at length consented, and conducted the spirit merchant to a cave, where he gave him a suit of serge clothes, which he said had belonged to his late brother, and in which he told him he could easily go. The merchant put them on, and returned home, when, to his great delight, he observed that no one could see him, but that if he changed into his ordinary clothes, everybody could see him as before. Accordingly, he set off with a fox for his neighbor's house, and when they arrived, the first thing they beheld was a charm on the wall, like a great wriggling dragon, at this the fox was greatly alarmed, and said, That scoundrel of a priest! I can't go any farther. He then ran off home, leaving the spirit merchant to proceed by himself. The latter walked quietly in to find that the dragon, on the wall, was a real one, and preparing to fly at him, so he too turned and ran away as fast as his legs could carry him. The fact was that the family had engaged a priest to drive away the fox influence, and he, not being able to go at the moment himself, gave them this charm to stick up on the wall. The following day the priest himself came, and arranging an altar, proceeded to exorcise the fox. All the villagers crowded round to see, and among others was a spirit merchant, who, in the middle of the ceremony, suddenly changed color, and hurried out of the front door, while he fell on the ground in the shape of a fox, having his clothes still hanging about his arms and legs. The bystanders would have killed him on the spot, but his wife begged them to spare him, and the priest let her take the fox home, where in a few days it died. End of chapter 155 Recording by Todd Chapter 156 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles 
Chapter 156 A Chinese Solomon In our district there lived two men, named Hu Cheng and Feng Nang, between whom there existed an old feud. The former, however, was the stronger of the two, and accordingly Feng disguised his feelings under a spacious appearance of friendship, though Hu never placed much faith in his professions. One day they were drinking together, and being both of them rather the worse for liquor, they began to brag of the various exploits they had achieved. "'What care I for poverty?' cried Hu, "'when I can lay a hundred ounces of silver on the table at a moment's notice.' Now Feng was well aware of the state of Hu's affairs, and did not hesitate to scout such pretensions, until Hu further informed him in perfect seriousness that the day before he had met a merchant travelling with a large sum of money and had tumbled him down a dry well by the wayside, in confirmation of which he produced several hundred ounces of silver, which really belonged to a brother-in-law on whose behalf he was managing some negotiation for the purchase of land. When they separated, Fang went off and gave information to the magistrate of the place, who summoned Hugh to answer to the charge. Hugh then told the actual facts of the case, and his brother-in-law and the owner of the land in question corroborated his statement. However, on examining the dry well by letting a man down with a rope round him, lo, there was a headless corpse lying at the bottom. Hugh was horrified at this, and called heaven to witness that he was innocent, whereupon the magistrate ordered him twenty or thirty blows on the mouth for lying in the presence of such irrefutable proof, and cast him into the condemned cell, where he lay loaded with chains. Orders were issued that the corpse was not to be removed, and a notification was made to the people, calling upon the relatives of the deceased to come forward and claim the body. Next day a woman appeared, and said deceased was her husband, that his name was Ho, and that he was proceeding on business with a large sum of money about him when he was killed by Hu. The magistrate observed that possibly the body in the well might not be that of her husband, to which the woman replied that she felt sure it was, and accordingly the corpse was brought up and examined, when the woman's story was found to be correct. She herself did not go near the body, but stood at a little distance making the most doleful lamentations, until at length the magistrate said, We have got the murderer, but the body is not complete. You go home and wait until the head has been discovered, when life shall be given for life. He then summoned Hu before him, and told him to produce the head by the next day under penalty of severe torture. But Hu only wandered about with the guard sent in charge of him, crying and lamenting his fate, but finding nothing. The instruments of torture were then produced, and preparations were made as if for torturing Hugh. However, they were not applied, and finally the magistrate sent him back to prison, saying, I suppose that in your hurry you didn't notice where you dropped the head. The woman was then brought before him again, and on learning that her relatives consisted only of one uncle, the magistrate remarked, A young woman like you, left alone in the world, will hardly be able to earn a likelihood. Here she burst into tears and implored the magistrate's pity. The punishment of the guilty man has been already decided upon, but until we get the head, the case cannot be closed. As soon as it is closed, the best thing you can do is to marry again. A young woman like yourself should not be in and out of a police court. The woman thanked the magistrate and retired, and the latter issued a notice to the people calling upon them to make a search for the head. On the following day, a man named Wang, a fellow villager of the deceased, reported that he had found the missing head, and his report proving to be true, he was rewarded the one thousand cash. The magistrate now summoned the woman's uncle above mentioned, and told him that the case was complete, but that as it involved such an important matter as the life of a human being, there would necessarily be some delays in closing it for good and all. Meanwhile, added the magistrate, your niece is a young woman and has no children. Persuade her to marry again, and so keep herself out of these troubles, and never mind what people may say. The uncle at first refused to do this, upon which the magistrate was obliged to threaten him until he was ultimately forced to consent. At this, the woman appeared before the magistrate to thank him for what he had done, whereupon the latter gave out that any person who was willing to take the woman to wife was to present himself at his yamen. Immediately afterwards an application was made, by the very man who had found the head. The magistrate then sent for the woman, and asked her if she could say who was the real murderer, to which she replied that Yu Cheng had done the deed. No, cried the magistrate, it was not he. It was you and this man here. Here both began loudly to protest their innocence. I have long known this, but fearing to leave the smallest loophole for escape, 
I have tarried thus long in elucidating the circumstances. How, to the woman, before the corpse was removed from the well, were you so certain that it was your husband's body? Because you already knew he was dead. And does a traitor who had several hundred ounces of silver upon him dress as shabbily as your husband was dressed? And you, to the man, how did you manage to find the head so readily? Because you were in a hurry to marry the woman. The two culprits stood as pale as death, unable to utter a word in their defense, and on the application of torture both confessed the crime. For this man, the woman's paramour, had killed her husband, curiously enough, about the time of Hugh Chang's braggart joke. Hugh was accordingly released, but Fang suffered the penalty of a false accuser. He was severely bambooed and banished for three years. The case was thus brought to a close without the wrongful punishment of a single person. End of chapter 156 Recording by Todd Chapter 157 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to 1935. Chapter 157. The Rock. Two herons built their nest under one of the ornaments on the roof of a temple at Tian Shin. The accumulated dust of years in the shrine below concealed a huge serpent, having the diameter of a washing basin. And whenever the heron's young were ready to fly, the reptile proceeded to the nest and swallowed every one of them, to the great distress of the bereaved parents. This took place three years consecutively, and people thought that the birds would build there no more. However, the following year they came again and when the time was drawing nigh for the young ones to take wing, away they flew and remained absent for nearly three days. On their return, they went straight to the nest and began amidst much noisy chattering to feed their young ones as usual. Just then the serpent crawled up to reach his prey, and as he was nearing the nest, the parent birds flew out and screamed loudly in midair. Immediately, there was heard a mighty flapping of wings, and darkness came over the face of the earth, which the astonished spectators now perceived to be caused by a huge bird obscuring the light of the sun. Down it swooped with the speed of wind or falling rain, and, striking the serpent with its talons, tore its head off at a blow, bringing down the same time several feet of the masonry of the temple. Then it flew away, the herons accompanying it as though escorting a guest. The nest too had come down, and of the two young birds one was killed by the fall. The other was taken by the priest and put in the bell tower, whither the old birds returned to feed it until thoroughly fledged when it spread its wings and was gone. End of chapter 157《ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、ハプタイトルは、A sportsman of Tianxin, having snared a wild goose, was followed to his home by the gander, which flew round and round him in great distress, and only went away at nightfall. Next day, when the sportsman went out, there was the bird again, and at length it alighted quite close to his feet. He was on the point of seizing it, when suddenly it stretched out its neck and disgorged a piece of pure gold, whereupon the sportsman, understanding what the bird meant, cried out, I see, this is to ransom your mate, eh? Accordingly, he at once released the goose, and the two birds flew away with many expressions of their mutual joy, leaving to the sportsman nearly three ounces of pure gold. 
Can then mere birds have such feelings as these? Of all sorrows there is no sorrow like separation from those we love, and it seems that the same holds good even of dumb animals. End of chapter 158「Chapter 159 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to The Elephants and the Lion A huntsman of Kuangsi who was out on the hills with his bow and arrows, lay down to rest a while, and unwittingly fell fast asleep. As he was slumbering, an elephant came up, and coiling his trunk around the man, carried him off. The latter gave himself up for dead, but before long the elephant had deposited him at the foot of a tall tree, and had summoned a whole herd of comrades, who crowded about the huntsman, as though asking his assistance. The elephant who had brought him went and lay down under the tree, and first looked up into its branches, and then looked down at the man, apparently requesting him to go up into the tree. So the latter jumped on the elephant's back, and then clambered up to the topmost branch, not knowing what he was expected to do next. By and by a lion arrived, and from among the frightened herd chose out a fat elephant, which he seemed as though about to devour. The others remained there trembling, not daring to run away, but looking wistfully up into the tree. Thereupon the huntsman drew an arrow from his quiver, and shot the lion dead, at which all the elephants below made him a grateful obeisance. He then descended, and the elephant lay down again, and invited him to mount by pulling at his clothes with its trunk. This he did, and was carried to a place where the animal scratched the ground with its foot, and revealed to him a vast number of old tusks. He jumped down and collected them in a bundle, after which the elephant conveyed him to a spot when she easily found his way home. End of chapter 159「Chapter 160 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eve. Social media at YS Eve Chan. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845-1935. Chapter 160 The Hidden Treasure Li Yu Xing was the second son of a rich old man who used to bury his money, and who was known to his fellow townsmen as Old Crocs. One day the father fell sick and summoned his sons to divide the property between them. He gave four fifths to the elder and only one fifth to the younger, saying to the latter, it is not that I love your brother more than I love you. I have other money stored away, and when you are alone, I will hand that over to you. A few days afterwards, the old man grew worse, and Yu Xing, afraid that his father might die at any moment, seized an opportunity of seeing him alone to ask about the money that he himself was to receive. Ah, replied the dying man, the sum of our joys and of our sorrows is determined by fate. You are now happy in the possession of a virtuous wife and have no right to an increase of wealth. For as a matter of fact, this second son was married to a lady from the Chi family whose virtue equaled that of any of the heroines of history, hence his father's remark. Yu Xing, however, was not satisfied, and implored to be allowed to have the money, and at length the old man got angry and said, You are only just turned twenty. You have known none of the trials of life, and were I to give a thousand ounces of gold, it would soon be all spent. Go, and until you have drunk the cup of bitterness to its dregs, expect no money from me. Now Yu Xing was a filial son, 
and when his father spoke thus he did not venture to say any more and hoped for his speedy recovery that he might have a chance of coaxing him to comply with his request but the old man got worse and worse and at length died whereupon the elder brother took no trouble about the funeral ceremonies leaving it all to the younger who being an open-handed fellow made no difficulties about the expense the latter was also fond of seeing a great deal of company at his house and his wife often had to get three or four meals a day ready for guests and as her husband did very little towards looking after his affairs and was further sponged upon by all the needy ones of the neighbourhood they were soon reduced to a state of poverty the elder brother helped them to keep body and soul together but he died shortly afterwards and this resource was cut off from them then by dint of borrowing in the spring and repaying in the autumn they still managed to exist until at last it came to the parting with their land and they were left actually destitute at that juncture their eldest son died followed soon after by his mother and yu xing was left almost by himself in the world he now married the widow of a sheep dealer who had a little capital and she was very strict with him and wouldn't let him waste time and money with his friends one night his father appeared to him and said my son you have drained your cup of bitterness to the dregs you shall now have the money i will bring it to you when yu xing woke up he thought it was merely a poor man's dream but the next day while laying the foundations of a wall he did come upon a quantity of gold and then he knew what his father had meant by when you are alone for of those about him at that time more than half were gone end of chapter 160 recording by eve social media at ys eve chan chapter 161 of strange stories from a chinese studio volume 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain strange stories from a chinese studio volume 2 by san ling pu translated by herbert allen giles 1845 to 1935 the boatman of lao lung when his excellency chu was viceroy of kuang tung there were constant complaints from the traders of mysterious disappearances sometimes as many as three or four of them disappearing at once and never being seen or heard of again at length a number of such cases filed of course against some person or persons unknown multiplied to such an extent that they were simply put on record and but little notice was further taken of them by the local officials thus when his excellency entered upon his duties he found more than a hundred planes of the kind besides innumerable cases in which the missing man's relative lived at a distance and had not in situated proceedings the mystery so preyed upon the new viceroy's mind that he lost all appetite for food and when finally all the inquiries he had set on foot resulted in no cue to an elucidation of these strange disappearances then his excellency proceeded to wash and purify himself and having noticed the municipal god he took to fasting and sleeping in his study alone while he was in ecstasy lo an official entered holding a tablet in his hand and said that he had come from the municipal temple with the following instructions to the viceroy snow on the whiskers descending live clouds falling from heaven wood and water buoyed up and the wall and opening affected the official then retired and the viceroy waked up but it was only after a night of tossing and turning that he hit upon what seemed to him the solution of the enigma first line argued he must signify old lao in chinese the second refers to the dragon, lung in Chinese. The third is clearly about a boat, and the fourth a door here taken in its secondary sense, man. Now to the east of the province, not far from the pass by which traders from the north connect their line of trade with the sovereign seas, 
there was actually a fairy known as the old dragon lao lang thither the viceroy immediately dispatched a force to arrest those employed in carrying people backwards and forwards more than fifty men were caught and they all confessed at once without the application of torture in fact they were bandits under the guise of boatmen and after beguiling passengers on board they would either drug them or burn stupefying incense until they were senseless finally cutting them open and putting a large stone inside to make the body sink such was the horrible story the discovery of which brought throngs to the viceroy's door to serenade him in terms of gratitude and praise End of chapter 161「Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 162. The Pious Surgeon. A certain veterinary surgeon named Houl was carrying food to his field laborers when suddenly a whirlwind arose in his path. Who will seized a spoon and poured out a libation of gruel, whereupon the wind immediately dropped. On another occasion, he was wandering about the municipal temple, when he noticed an image of Liu Chuan presenting the melon, in whose eye was a great splotch of dirt. "'Dear me, Sir Liu,' cried Hu, "'who has been ill-using you like this?' He then scraped away the dirt with his fingernail and passed on. Some years afterward, as he was laying down very ill, two lictors walked in and carried him off to a yamen where they insisted on his bribing them heavily who was at his wit's end what to do but just at that moment a personage dressed in green robes came forth who was greatly astonished at seeing him there and asked what it all meant our hero at once explained whereupon the man in green turned upon the lictors and abused them for not shewing proper respect to mr Hu. meanwhile a drum sounded like the roll of thunder, and the man in green told Hu that it was for the morning session, and that he would have to attend. Leading Hu within, he put him in his proper place, and promising to inquire into the charge against him, went forward and whispered a few words to one of the clerks. Oh, said the latter, advancing and making a bow to the veterinary surgeon, yours is a trifling matter. We shall merely have to confront you with a horse, and then you can go home again. Shortly afterwards, Huo's case was called, upon which he went forward and knelt down, as did also a horse which was prosecuting him. The judge now informed Huo that he was accused by the horse of having caused its death by medicines, and asked him if he pleaded guilty or not guilty. My lord, replied Huo, the prosecutor was attacked by the cattle plague, for which I treated him accordingly, and he actually recovered from the disease, though he died on the following day. Am I to be held responsible for that? The horse now proceeded to tell his story, and after the usual cross-examination and cries for justice, the judge gave orders to look up the horse's term of life in the Book of Fate. Therein it appeared that the animal's destiny had doomed it to death on the very day on which it had died. Whereupon the judge cried out, Your terms of years had already expired. Why bring this false charge? Away with you! And turning to Hua, the judge added, You are a worthy man, and may be permitted to live. The lictors were accordingly instructed to escort him back, and with them went out both the clerk and the man in green clothes, who bade the lictors take every possible care of Hua by the way. You gentlemen are very kind, said Hua, but I haven't the honor of your acquaintance, and should be glad to know to whom I am so much indebted. Three years ago, replied the man in green, I was traveling in your neighborhood, and was suffering very much from thirst, which you relieved for me by a few spoonfuls of gruel. I have not forgotten that act. And my name, observed the other, is Liu Chuan. You once took a splotch of dirt out of my eye. That was troubling me very much. I am only sorry that the wine and food we have down here is unsuitable to offer you. Farewell. 
Hulanel understood all that had happened, and went off home with the two lictors where he would have regaled them with some refreshment, but they refused to take even a cup of tea. He then waked up and found that he had been dead for two days. From this time forth he led a more virtuous life than ever, always pouring out libations to Liu Chuan at all the festivals of the year. Thus he reached the age of eighty, a hale and hearty man, still able to sit in the saddle, until one day he met Liu Chuan riding on horseback, as if about to make a long journey. After a little friendly conversation, the latter said to him, Your time is up, and a warrant for your arrest is already issued, but I have ordered the constables to delay a while, and you can now spend three days in preparing for death, at the expiration of which I will come and fetch you. I have purchased a small appointment for you in the realms below, by which you will be more comfortable. So Hoel went home and told his wife and children, and after collecting his friends and relatives, and making all necessary preparations, on the evening of the fourth day he cried out, Liu Chuan has come! And getting into his coffin, lay down and died. End of chapter 162 The Pious Surgeon Chapter 163 of Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 163, Another Solomon. At Taiyuan, there lived a middle-aged woman with her widowed daughter-in-law, the former was on terms of too great intimacy with a notably bad character of the neighborhood, and the latter, who objected very strongly to this, did her best to keep the man from the house. The elder woman accordingly tried to send the other back to her family, but she would not go, and at length things came to such a pass that the mother-in-law actually went to the mandarin of the place and charged her daughter-in-law with the offense she herself was committing. When the Mandarin inquired the name of the man concerned, she said she had only seen him in the dark, and didn't know who he was, referring him for information to the accused. The latter, on being summoned, gave the man's name, but retorted the charge on her mother-in-law. And when the man was confronted with them, he promptly declared both their stories to be false. The Mandarin, however, said there was a prima facie case against him, and ordered him to be severely beaten, whereupon he confessed that it was the daughter-in-law whom he went to visit. This the woman herself flatly denied, even under torture, and on being released appealed to a higher court, with a very similar result. Thus the case dragged on, until a Mr. Soon, who was well known for his judicial acumen, was appointed district magistrate at that place. Calling the parties before him, he bade his lictors prepare stones and knives, at which they were much exercised in their minds, the severest tortures allowed by law being merely jives and fetters. However, everything was got ready, and the next day Mr. Soon proceeded with his investigation. After hearing all that each one of the three had to say, he delivered the following judgment. The case is a simple one, for although I cannot say which of you two women is the guilty one, there is no doubt about the man, who has evidently been the means of bringing discredit on a virtuous family. Take these stones and knives there, and put him to death. I will be responsible. Thereupon the two women began to stone the man, especially the younger one, who seized the biggest stones she could see, and threw them at him with all the might of her pent-up anger while the mother-in-law chose small stones and struck him on non-vital parts. So with the knives, the daughter-in-law would have killed him at the first blow, had not the mandarin stopped her and said, Hold, I now know who is the guilty woman. The mother-in-law was then tortured until she confessed, and the case was thus terminated. End of chapter 163, Another Solomon Chapter 164 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Incorrupt Official Mr. Wu, sub-prefect of Qi Nan, was an upright man, and would have no share in the bribery and corruption which was extensively carried on, and at which the higher authorities connived, and in the proceeds of which they actually shared. The prefect tried to bully him into adopting a similar plan, and went so far as to abuse him in violent language, upon which Mr. Wu fired up and exclaimed, Though I am but a subordinate official, you should impeach me for anything you have against me in the regular way. You have not the right to abuse me thus. Die I may, but I will never consent to degrade my office and turn aside the course of justice for the sake of filthy lucre. At this outbreak, the prefect changed his tone and tried to soothe him. How dare people accuse the age of being corrupt? when it is themselves who will not walk in the straight path. One day after this, a certain fox medium came to the prefect's yamen, just as a feast was in full swing, and was thus addressed by a guest. You who pretend to know everything, say how many officials there are in this prefecture. One, replied the medium, at which the company laughed heartily, until the medium continued, there are really seventy-two holders of office, but Mr. Sub-Prefect Hu is the only one who can justly be called an official. End of chapter 164「Appendix A, Part 1 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Appendix A, Part 1. Visitors to Chinese temples of the Taoist persuasion usually make at once for what is popularly known amongst foreigners as the Chamber of Horrors. These belong specially to Taoism or the ethics of right in the abstract as opposed to abstract wrong, and are not found in temples consecrated to the religion of Buddha. Modern Taoism, however, once a purely metaphysical system, is now so leavened with the superstitions of Buddhism, and has borrowed so much material from its younger rival that an ordinary Chinaman can hardly tell one from the other, and generally regards them as to all intents and purposes the same. These rightly named Chamber of Horrors, for Madame Toussaint has nothing more ghastly to show in the whole of her wonderful collection, represent the ten courts of purgatory, through some or all of which erring souls must pass before they are suffered to be born again into the world under another form, or transferred to the eternal bliss reserved for the righteous alone. As a description of these ten courts may not be uninteresting to some of my readers, and as the subject has a direct bearing upon many of the stories in the previous collection, I hereto append my translation of a well-known Taoist work which is circulated gratuitously all over the Chinese Empire, by people who are anxious to lay up a store of good works against the day of reckoning to come. Those who are acquainted with Dante's Divine Comedy will recollect that the poet's idea of a Christian purgatory was a series of nine lessening circles, arranged one above the other so as to form a cone. The Taoist believes that his purgatory consists of ten courts of justice, situated in different positions at the bottom of a great ocean which lies down in the depths of the earth. These are subdivided into special wards, different forms of torture being inflicted in each. A perusal of this work will show what punishments the wicked Chinaman has to expect in the unseen world, and by what means he may hope to obtain a partial or complete remission of his sins. The Divine Panorama, 
published by the mercy of U.T., that men and women may repent them of their faults and make atonement for their crimes. On the birthday of the Savior Prusa, as the spirits of purgatory were thronging round to offer their congratulations, the ruler of the infernal regions spake as follows. My wish is to release all souls, and every moon as this day comes round, I would wholly or partially remit the punishment of erring shades, and give them life once more in one of the six paths. But, alas, the wicked are many and the virtuous few. Nevertheless, the punishments in the dark region are too severe and require some modification. Any wicked soul that repents and induces one or two others to do likewise shall be allowed to set this off against the punishments which should be inflicted. The judges of the ten courts of purgatory then agreed that all who led virtuous lives from their youth upwards shall be escorted at their death to the land of the immortals, that all whose balance of good and evil is exact shall escape the bitterness of the three states, and be born again among men, that those who have repaid their debts of gratitude and friendship, and fulfilled their destiny, yet have a balance of evil against them, shall pass through the various courts of purgatory, and then be born again amongst men, rich, poor, old, young, diseased, or crippled, to be put a second time upon trial. Then, if they behave well, they may enter into some happy state. But if badly, they will be dragged by horrid devils through all the courts, suffering bitterly as they go, and will again be born to endure in life the uttermost of poverty and wretchedness, in death the everlasting tortures of hell. Those who are disloyal, unfilial, who commit suicide, take life, or disbelieve the doctrine of cause and effect, saying to themselves that when a man dies there is an end of him, that when he has lost his skin he has already suffered the worst that can befall him, that living men can be tortured, but no one ever saw a man's ghost in the pillory, that after death all is unknown, etc., etc. Truly these men do not know that the body alone perishes, but the soul lives for ever and ever, and that whatsoever evil they do in this life, the same will be done unto them in the life to come. All who commit such crimes are handed over to the everlasting tortures of hell, for alas, in spite of the teachings of the three systems, some will persist in regarding these warnings as vain and empty talk. Lightly they speak of divine mercy, and knowingly commit many crimes, not more than one in a hundred ever coming to repentance. Therefore, the punishments of purgatory were strictly carried out, and the tortures dreadfully severe. But now it has been mercifully ordained that any man or woman, young, old, weak, or strong, who may have sinned in any way, shall be permitted to obtain remission of the same by keeping his or her thoughts constantly fixed on Pusa, and on the birthdays of the judges of the ten courts, by fasting and prayer, and by vows never to sin again. Or for every good work done in life they shall be allowed to escape one ward in the courts below. From this rule to be accepted disloyal ministers, unfilial sons, suicides, those who plot in secret against good people, those who are struck by lightning, literally thunder, those who perish by flood or fire, by wild animals or poisonous reptiles, these to pass through all the courts and be punished according to their deserts, all other sinners to be allowed to claim their good works as a set-off against evil, thus partly escaping the agonies of hell and receiving some reward for their virtuous deeds. This account of man's wickedness on the earth and the punishments in store for him was written in language intelligibly to every man and woman, 
and was submitted for the approval of Pusa, the intention being to wait the return of some virtuous soul among the sons of men, and by these means publish it all over the earth. When Pusa saw what had been done, he said it was good, and on the third of the eighth moon proceeded with the ten judges of purgatory to lay this book before God. Then God said, Good indeed, good indeed. Henceforth let all spirits take note of any mortal who vows to lead a virtuous life, and repenting, promises to sin no more. Two punishments shall be remitted him, and if, in addition to this, he succeeds in doing five virtuous acts, then he shall escape all punishment and be born again in some happy state. If a woman, she shall be born as a man. But more than five virtuous acts shall enable such a soul to obtain the salvation of others and redeem wife and family from the tortures of hell. Let these regulations be published in the divine panorama and circulated on earth by the spirits of the city guardian. In fear and trembling, obey this decree and carry it reverently into effect. End of Appendix A, Part 1appendix a part two of strange stories from a chinese studio volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain strange stories from a chinese studio volume two by songling pu translated by herbert allen giles appendix a part two the ten courts of justice the first court his infernal majesty, Chin Kuang, is specially in charge of the register of life and death, both for old and young, and presides at the judgment seat in the lower regions. His court is situated in the great ocean, away beyond the Wuxiao Rock, far to the west, near the murky road which leads to the Yellow Springs. Every man and woman dying in old age, whose fate is to be born again into the world, if their tale of good and evil works is equally balanced, are sent to the first court, and thence transferred back to life, male becoming female, female male, rich poor and poor rich, according to their several deserts. But those whose good deeds are outnumbered by their bad are sent to a terrace on the right of the court, called the Terrace of the Mirror of Sin, ten feet in height. The mirror is about fifty feet in circumference and hangs towards the east. Above are seven characters written horizontally. Sin Mirror Terrace upon no good men. There the wicked souls are able to see the naughtiness of their own hearts while they were among the living, and the danger of death and hell. Then do they realize the proverb, Ten thousand tales of yellow gold cannot be brought away, but every crime will tell its tale upon the judgment day. When the souls have been to the terrace and seen their wickedness, they are forwarded into the second court, where they are tortured and dismissed to the proper hell. Should there be any one enjoying life without reflecting that heaven and earth produce mortals, that father and mother bring the child to maturity, truly no easy matter, and ignoring the four obligations before receiving the summons, lightly sever the thread of their own existence by cutting their throats, hanging, poisoning, or drowning themselves. Then such suicides, if the deed was not done out of loyalty, filial piety, chastity, or friendship, for which they would go to heaven, but in a trivial burst of rage, or fearing the consequences of a crime which would not amount to death, or in the hope of falsely injuring a fellow-creature, 
than such suicides, when the last breath has left their bodies, shall be escorted to this court by the spirits of the threshold and of the hearth. They shall be placed in the hunger and thirst section, and every day from seven till eleven o'clock they will resume their mortal coil and suffer again the pain and bitterness of death after seventy days or one or two years as the case may be they will be conducted back to the scene of their suicide but will not be permitted to taste the funeral meats or avail themselves of the usual offerings to the dead Bitterly they will repent, unable as they will be to render themselves visible and frighten people, vainly striving to procure a substitute. For when the substitute shall have been harmlessly entrapped, the spirits of the threshold and hearth will reconduct the erring soul back to this court, whence it will be sent on to the second court, where its balance of good and evil will be struck, and dreadful tortures applied, being finally passed on through the various courts to the utter misery of hell. Should any one have such intention of suicide, and thus threaten a fellow creature, even though he does not commit the act, but continues to live not without virtue, yet shall it not be permitted in any way to remit his punishment. Any soul which after suicide shall not remain invisible, but shall frighten people to death, will be seized by black-faced, long-tusked devils, and tortured in the various hells to be finally thrust into the great Gehenna, for ever to remain hung up in chains, and not permitted to be born again. Every Buddhist or Taoist priest, who receives money for prayers and liturgies, but skips over words and misses out sentences, on arriving at this, the first court, will be sent to the section for the completion of prayer, and there, in a small dark room, he shall pick out such passages as he has omitted, and make good the deficiency as best he can, by the uncertain light of an infinitesimal wick burning in a gallon of oil. Even good and virtuous priests must also repair any omissions they may have accidentally made, and so must every man or woman who in private devotion may have omitted or wrongly repeated any part of the sacred writings from over-earnestness, their attention not being properly fixed on the actual words they repeat. The same applies to female priests. A dispensation from Buddha to remit such punishment is put in force on the first day of each month when the names are entered into the register of the virtuous. O ye dwellers upon earth, on the first day of the second moon, fasting, turn to the north, and make oath to abstain from evil and fix your thoughts on good, that ye may escape hell. The precepts of Buddha are circulated over the whole world to warn mankind to believe and repent, that when the last hour comes, their spirits may be escorted by dark-robed boys to realms of bliss and happiness in the West. The Second Court His Infernal Majesty, Chu Ching, reigns at the bottom of the great ocean. Away to the south, below the Wuchow rocks, he has a vast hell, many leagues in extent, and subdivided into sixteen wards, as follows. In the first, nothing but black clouds and constant sandstorms. In the second, mud and filth. In the third, chevaux de frise. In the fourth, gnawing hunger. In the fifth, burning thirst. In the sixth, blood and pus. In the seventh, the shades are plunged into a brazen cauldron of boiling water. In the eighth, the same punishment is repeated many times. In the ninth, they are put into iron clothes. In the tenth, they are stretched on a rack to regulation length. 
In the eleventh, they are pecked by fowls. In the twelfth, they have only rivers of lime to drink. In the thirteenth, they are hacked to pieces. In the fourteenth, the leaves of the trees are as sharp as sword points. In the fifteenth, they are pursued by foxes and wolves. In the sixteenth, all is ice and snow. Those who lead astray young boys and girls, and then escape punishment by cutting off their hair and entering the priesthood, those who filch letters, pictures, books, etc., entrusted to their care, and then pretend to have lost them, those who injure a fellow creature's ear, eye, hand, foot, fingers, or toes, those who practice as doctors without any knowledge of the medical art, those who will not ransom grown-up slave girls, those who, contracting marriage for the sake of gain, falsely state their ages, or those who, in cases of betrothal, before actual marriage, find out that one of the contracting parties is a bad character, and yet do not come forward to say so, but inflict an irreparable wrong on the innocent one. Such offenders, when their quota of crime has been cast up, their youth or age and the consequences of their acts taken into consideration, will be seized by horrid red-faced devils and thrust into the great hell and thence dispatched to the particular ward in which they are to be tormented. When their time of suffering there has expired, they will be moved into the third hall, there to be tortured and passed on to the Gehenna. O ye men and women of the world, take this book and warn all sinners or copy it out and circulate it for general information. If you see people sick and ill, give medicine to heal them. If you see people poor and hungry, feed them. If you see people in difficulties, give money to save them. Repent your past errors, and you will be allowed to cancel that evil by future good, so that when the hour arrives, you will pass at once into the tenth hall, and thence return again to existence on earth. Let such as love all creatures endowed with life, and do not recklessly cut and slay, but teach their children not to harm small animals and insects. Let these, on the first of the third moon, register an oath not to take life, but to aid in preserving it. Thus they will avoid passing through purgatory, and will also enter at once the tenth hall, to be born again in some happy state. The Third Court His Infernal Majesty Sung Ti reigns at the bottom of the great ocean, away to the southeast, below the Wu Chow Rock, in the Gehenna of Black Ropes. This hall is many leagues wide, and is subdivided into sixteen wards as follows. In the first, everything is salt. Above, below, and all around, the eye rests upon salt alone. The shades feed upon it, and suffer horrid torments in consequence. When the fit has passed away, they return to it once again, and suffer agonies more unutterable than before. In the second, the erring shades are bound with cords and carry heavily weighted kangs. In the third, they are perpetually pierced through the ribs. In the fourth, their faces are scraped with iron and copper knives. In the fifth, their fat is scraped away from their bodies. In the sixth, their hearts and livers are squeezed with pincers. In the seventh, their eyes are gouged. In the eighth, they are flayed. In the ninth, their feet are cut off. In the tenth, their fingernails and toenails are pulled out. In the eleventh, their blood is sucked. In the twelfth, they are hung up head downwards. In the thirteenth, their shoulder bones are split. In the fourteenth, they are tormented by insects and reptiles. In the fifteenth, they are beaten on the thighs. In the sixteenth, 
their hearts are scratched. Those who enjoy the light of day without reflecting on the imperial bounty, officers of state who revel in large emoluments without reciprocating their sovereign's goodness, private individuals who do not repay the debt of water and earth, wives and concubines who slight their marital lords, those who fail in their duties as acting sons, or such as reap what advantages there are, and they go off to their own homes, slaves who disregard their masters, official underlings who are ungrateful to their superiors, working partners who behave badly to the moneyed partner, culprits who escape from prison or abscond from their place of banishment, those who break their bail and get others into trouble, and those infatuated ones who have long omitted to pray and repent, all these, even though they have a set-off of good deeds, must pass through the misery of every ward. Those who interfere with another man's feng shui, those who obstruct funeral obsequies or the completion of graves, those who in digging come on a coffin and do not immediately cover it up but injure the bones, those who steal or avoid paying up their quota of grain, those who lose record of the site of their family burying place, those who incite others to commit crimes, those who promote litigation, those who write anonymous placards, those who repudiate a betrothal, those who forge deeds and other documents, those who receive payment of a debt without signing a receipt or giving up the IOU, those who counterfeit signatures and seals, those who alter bills, those who injure posterity in any way, all these and similar offenders shall be punished according to the gravity of each offense. Devils with big knives will seize the erring ones and thrust them into the great Gehenna, besides which they shall expiate their sins in the proper number of wards, and shall then be forwarded to the fourth court, where they shall be tortured and dismissed to the general Gehenna. O ye sons of men, on the eighth day of the second moon, register an oath that ye will do no evil. Thus you may escape the bitterness of these hells. The Fourth Court The Lord of the Five Senses reigns at the bottom of the great ocean, away to the east below the Wu Chao Rock. His court is many leagues wide, and is subdivided into sixteen wards as follows. In the first, the wicked shades are hung up, and water is continually poured over them. In the second, they are made to kneel on chains and pieces of split bamboo. In the third, their hands are scalded with boiling water. In the fourth, their hands swell and stream with perspiration. In the fifth, their muscles are cut and their bones pulled out. In the sixth, their shoulders are pricked with a trident and the skin rubbed with a hard brush. In the seventh, holes are bored into their flesh. In the eighth, they are made to sit on spikes. In the ninth, they wear iron clothes. In the tenth, they are placed under heavy pieces of wood, stone, earth, or tiles. In the eleventh, their eyes are put out. In the twelfth, their mouths are choked with dust. In the thirteenth, they are perpetually dosed with nasty medicines. In the fourteenth, it is so slippery, they are always falling down. In the fifteenth, their mouths are painfully pricked. In the sixteenth, their bodies are buried under broken stones, etc., the head alone being left out. Those who cheat the customs and evade taxes, those who repudiate their rent, use weighted scales, sell sham medicines, water their rice, utter base coin, get deeply in debt, sell doctored silks and satins, scrape or add size to linen cloth, those who do not make way for the cripples 
old and young, those who encroach upon petty trade rights of old or young, those who delay in delivering letters entrusted to them, steal bricks from walls as they pass by, or oil and candles from lamps, poor people who do not behave properly, and rich people who are not compassionate to the poor, those who promise a loan and go back on their word, those who see people suffering from illness, yet cannot bring themselves to part with certain useful drugs they may have in their possession, those who know good prescriptions but keep them secret, those who throw vessels which have contained medicine or broken cups and bottles into the street, those who allow their mules and ponies to be a nuisance to other people, those who destroy their neighbor's crops or his walls and fences, those who try to bewitch their enemies, and those who try to frighten people in any way, all these shall be punished according to the gravity of their offenses, and shall be thrust by the devils into the great Gehenna until their time arrives for passing into the fifth court. O ye children of this world, if on the eighteenth day of the second moon you register an oath to sin no more, then you may escape the various wards of this hall. And if to this book you add examples of rewards and punishments following upon virtues and crimes, and hand them down to posterity for the good of the human race, so that all who read may repent them of their wickedness, then they will be without sin, and you not without merit. The Fifth Court His Infernal Majesty, Yen Lo, said, Our proper place is in the First Court, but pitying those who die by foul means, and should be sent back to earth to have their wrongs redressed, we have moved our judgment seat to the great hell at the bottom of the ocean, away to the northeast below the Wu Chow Rock, and have subdivided this hell into sixteen wards for the torment of souls. All those shades who come before us have already suffered long tortures in the previous four courts, whence, if they are hardened sinners, they are passed on after seven days to this court, where, if again found to be utterly hardened, corruption will overtake them by the fifth or seventh day. All shades cry out, either that they have left some vow unfulfilled, or that they wish to build a temple or bridge, make a road, clean out a river or well, publish some book teaching people to be virtuous, that they have not released their due number of lives, that they have filial duties or funeral obsequies to perform, some act of kindness to repay, etc., etc. For these reasons, they pray to be allowed to return once more to the light of day, and are always ready to make oath that henceforth they will lead most exemplary lives. We, hearing this, reply, In days gone by ye openly worked evil, but now that your boat has reached the midstream, ye bethink yourselves of caulking the leak. For although Pusa, in his great mercy, decreed that there should be a modification of torture, and that good works might be set off against evil, the same being submitted to God, and ratified by divine decree to be further published in the realms below and in the infernal city, yet we judges of the ten courts have not yet received one single virtuous man among us, who, coming in the flesh, might carry this divine panorama back with him to the light of day. Truly, those who suffer in hell and on earth cannot complain, and virtuous men are rare. But now ye have come to my court, having beheld your own wickedness in the mirror of sin. No more bull-headed, horse-faced devils, away with them to the terrace, that they may once more gaze upon their lost homes. 
this terrace is curved in front like a bow it looks east west and south it is eighty one li from one extreme to the other the back part is like the string of the bow it is enclosed by a wall of sharp swords it is four hundred and ninety feet high its sides are knife blades and the whole is in sixty three stories no good shade comes to this terrace neither do those whose balance of good and evil is exact wicked souls alone behold their homes close by and can see and hear what is going on they hear old and young talking together they see their last wishes disregarded and their instructions disobeyed everything seems to have undergone a change the property they scraped together with so much trouble is dissipated and gone the husband thinks of taking another wife the widow meditates second nuptials strangers are in possession of the old estate there is nothing to divide amongst the children debts long since paid are brought again for settlement and the survivors are called upon to acknowledge claims upon the departed debts owed are lost for want of evidence with endless recrimination abuse and general confusion all of which falls upon the three families of the deceased they in their anger speak ill of him that is gone he sees his children become corrupt and his friends fall away some perhaps for the sake of bygone times may stroke the coffin and let fall a tear departing quickly with a cold smile worse than that the wife sees her husband tortured in the yamen the husband sees his wife victim to some horrible disease lands gone houses destroyed by flood or fire and everything in unutterable confusion the reward of former sins all souls after the misery of the terrace will be thrust into the great gehenna and when the amount of wickedness of each has been ascertained they will be passed through the sixteen wards for the punishment of evil hearts in the gehenna they will be buried under wooden pillars bound with copper snakes crushed by iron dogs tied tightly hand and foot be ripped open and have their hearts torn out minced up and given to snakes their entrails being thrown to dogs then when their time is up the pain will cease and their bodies become whole once more preparatory to being passed through the sixteen wards in the first are non-worshippers and skeptics in the second those who have destroyed or hurt living creatures in the third those who do not fulfil their vows in the fourth believers in false doctrines magicians and sorcerers in the fifth those who tyrannize over the weak but cringe to the strong also those who openly wish for another's death in the sixth those who try to put their misfortunes on to other people's shoulders in the seventh those who lead immoral lives in the eighth those who injure others to benefit themselves in the ninth those who are parsimonious and will not help people in trouble in the tenth those who steal and involve the innocent in the eleventh those who forget kindness or seek revenge in the twelfth those who by pernicious drugs stir up others to quarrel keeping themselves out of harm's way in the thirteenth those who deceive or spread false reports in the fourteenth those who love brawling and implicate others in the fifteenth those who envy the virtuous and wise in the sixteenth those who are lost in vice evil speakers slanderers and such like all who disbelieve the doctrine of cause and effect who obstruct good works make a pretense of piety talk of other people's sins burn or injure religious books omit to fast when praying for the sick interfere with the adoration of buddha slander the priesthood or if scholars abstain from instructing women and children those who dig up graves and obliterate all traces thereof to set light to woods and forests 
allow their servants to be careless in handling fire and thus endanger their neighbor's property those who wantonly discharge arrows and bolts who try their strength against the sick or weak throw potsherds over a wall poison fish let off guns catch birds with either the net sticky pole or trap those who throw down salt to kill plants who do not bury dead cats and venomous snakes deep in the ground who dig out corpses who break the soil or alter their walls and stoves at wrong seasons who encroach on the public road or take possession of other people's land who fill up wells and drains etc etc all these when they return from the terrace shall first be tortured in the great gehenna and then such as are to have their hearts minced shall be passed into the sixteen wards thence to be sent on to the sixth court for the punishment of other crimes those who in life have not been guilty of the above sins or having sinned did on the eighth day of the first moon fasting register a vow to sin no more shall not only escape the punishments of this court but shall also gain some further remission of torture in the sixth court those however who are guilty of taking life of gross immorality of stealing and implicating the innocent of ingratitude and revenge of infatuated vice which no warnings can turn from its course these shall not escape one jot of their punishments the sixth court this court is situated at the bottom of the great ocean due north of the wu chow rock it is a vast noisy gehenna many leagues in extent and around it are sixteen wards in the first the souls are made to kneel for long periods on iron shot in the second they are placed up to their necks in filth in the third they are pounded till the blood runs out in the fourth their mouths are opened with iron pincers and filled full of needles in the fifth they are bitten by rats in the sixth they are enclosed in a net of thorns and nipped by locusts in the seventh they are crushed to a jelly in the eighth their skin is lacerated and they are beaten on the raw in the ninth their mouths are filled with fire in the tenth they are licked by flames in the eleventh they are subjected to noisome smells in the twelfth they are butted by oxen and trampled on by horses in the thirteenth their hearts are scratched in the fourteenth their heads are rubbed till their skulls come off in the fifteenth they are chopped in two at the waist in the sixteenth their skin is taken off and rolled up into spills those discontented ones who rail against heaven and revile earth who are always finding fault either with the wind thunder heat cold fine weather or rain those who let their tears fall towards the north who steal the gold from the inside or scrape the gilding from the outside of images those who take holy names in vain who show no respect for written paper who throw down dirt and rubbish near pagodas or temples who use dirty cookhouses and stoves for preparing the sacrificial meats who do not abstain from eating beef and dog flesh those who have in their possession blasphemous or obscene books and do not destroy them who obliterate or tear books which teach man to be good who carve on common articles of household use the symbol of the origin of all things the sun and moon and seven stars the royal mother and the god of longevity on the same article or representations of any of the immortals those who embroider the swastika on fancy work or mark characters on silk satin or cloth on banners beds chairs tables or any kind of utensil those who secretly wear clothes adorned with the dragon and the phoenix only to be trampled under foot who buy up grain and hold until the price is exorbitantly high all these shall be thrust into the great and noisy gehenna there to be examined as to their misdeeds and passed accordingly 
into one of the sixteen wards, whence, at the expiration of their time, they will be sent for further questioning on to the seventh court. All dwellers upon earth who on the eighth day of the third moon, fasting, register a vow from that date to sin no more, and on the fourteenth and fifteenth of the fifth moon, the third of the eighth moon, and the tenth of the tenth moon, to practice abstinence, vowing moreover to exert themselves to convert others, these shall escape the bitterness of all the above-mentioned wards. The Seventh Court His Infernal Majesty, Tai Shan, reigns at the bottom of the great ocean, away to the northwest below the Wu Chao Rock. His is a vast, noisy court, measuring many leagues in circumference, and subdivided into sixteen wards as follows. In the first, the wicked souls are made to swallow their own blood. In the second, the legs are pierced and thrust into a fiery pit. In the third, their chests are cut open. In the fourth, their hair is torn out with iron combs. In the fifth, they are gnawed by dogs. In the sixth, great stones are placed on their heads. In the seventh, their skulls are pierced. In the eighth, they wear fiery clothes. In the ninth, their skin is torn and pulled by pigs. In the tenth, they are pecked by huge birds. In the eleventh, they are hung up and beaten on the feet. In the twelfth, their tongues are pulled out and their jaws bored. In the thirteenth, they are disemboweled. In the fourteenth, they are trampled on by mules and bitten by badgers. In the fifteenth, their fingers are ironed with hot irons. In the sixteenth, they are boiled in oil. All mortals who practice eating red lead and certain other nauseous articles, who spend more than they should upon wine, who kidnap human beings for sale, who steal clothes and ornaments from coffins, who break up dead men's bones for medicine, who separate people from their relatives, who sell the girl bought up in the house to be their son's wife, who allow their wives to drown female children, who stifle their illegitimate offspring, who unite to cheat another in gambling, who act as tutors without being properly strict and thus wrong their pupils, who beat and injure their slaves without estimating the punishment by the fault, who regard districts entrusted to their charges in the light of so much spoil, who disobey their elders, who talk at random and go back on their word, who stir up others to quarrel and fight, all these shall upon verification of their sins be taken from the great Gehenna and passed through the proper wards, to be forwarded, when their time has expired, to the eighth court, again to be tortured according to their deserts. All things may not be used as drugs. It is bad enough to slay birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes in order to prepare medicine for the sick. But to use red lead in many of the filthy messes in vogue is beyond all bounds of decency, and those who foul their mouths with these nasty mixtures, no matter how virtuous they may be otherwise, will not only derive no benefit from saying their prayers, but will be punished for so doing without mercy. Ye who hear these words, make haste to repent. From today, forbear to take life. Buy many birds and animals in order to set them free. And every morning when you wash your teeth, mutter a prayer to Buddha. Thus, when your last hour comes, a good angel will stand by your side and purify you of your former sins. Some steal the bones of people who have been burnt to death, or the bodies of illegitimate children, for the purpose of compounding medicines. Others steal skulls and bones from graves with the same object. Worst of all are those who carry off bones by the basketful, using the hard ones for making various articles and grinding down the soft ones for the manufacture of pottery. These, no matter what may have been their good works on earth, will not obtain thereby any remission of punishment, 
but when they are brought down below the ruler of the infernal regions will first pass them from the great gehenna into the proper wards and will send instructions to the tenth court that when they are born again on earth it shall be either without ears or eyes hand foot mouth lips or nose or maimed in some way or other yet such as have thus sinned may still avoid this punishment if only they are willing to pray and repent vowing never to sin again or if they buy coffins for the poor and persuade others to do likewise by these means giving a decent burial to many corpses then when the death summons comes the spirits of the home and hearth will make a black mark upon the warrant and punishment will be remitted sometimes when there is a famine people have nothing to eat and die of hunger and wicked men almost before the breath is out of their bodies cut them up and sell their flesh to others for food a horrid crime indeed those who are guilty of such practices will on arrival in the lower regions be tortured in the various courts for the space of forty-nine days and then the judge of the tenth court will be instructed to notify the judge of the first court to put them down in his register for a new birth if among men as hungry famished outcasts and if among animals as loathing the food that falls to their lot and by and by perishing of hunger such is their reward besides the above those who have eaten what is unfit for food and willingly continue to do so will be punished either among men or animals according to their deserts their throats will swell and though devoured by hunger they will be unable to swallow and thus die those who do not err a second time may be forgiven as they deserve but those who in times of distress subscribe money for their sufferers prepare gruel give away rice to the needy or distribute ginger tea and soup in the open street and thus sustain life a little longer and do real good to their fellow creatures all these shall not only obtain remission of their sins but carry on a balance of good to their account which will ensure them a happy old age in the life to come of the above three clauses two were proposed by the officials attached to this seventh court the third by the chief justice of the great gehenna and the whole submitted together for the approval of god the following rescript being obtained let it be as proposed let the three clauses be copied into the divine panorama and let the officials concerned be promoted or rewarded also in case of crimes other than those already provided for let such be punished according to the statutes of the rulers of the four continents on earth and let any evasion of punishment and implication of innocent people be at once reported by the proper officials for our consideration this from the throne obey o ye sons and daughters of men if on the twenty-seventh of the third moon fasting and turn towards the north ye register a vow to pray and repent and to publish the whole of the divine panorama for the enlightenment of mankind then ye may escape the bitterness of this seventh court the eighth court his infernal majesty tu shi reigns at the bottom of the great ocean due east below the wu chow rock in a vast noisy court many leagues in extent subdivided into sixteen wards as follows in the first the wicked souls are rolled down mountains in carts in the second they are shut up in huge saucepans in the third they are minced in the fourth their noses eyes mouths etc are stopped up in the fifth their uvulas are cut off in the sixth they are exposed to all kinds of filth in the seventh their extremities are cut off in the eighth their viscera are fried 
in the ninth their marrow is cauterized in the tenth their bowels are scratched in the eleventh they are inwardly burned with fire in the twelfth they are disemboweled in the thirteenth their chests are torn open in the fourteenth their skulls are split and their teeth dragged out in the fifteenth they are hacked and gashed in the sixteenth they are pricked with steel prongs those who are unfilial who do not nourish their relatives while alive or bury them when dead who subject their parents to fright sorrow or anxiety if they do not quickly repent them of their former sins the spirit of the hearth will report their misdoings and gradually deprive them of what prosperity they may be enjoying those who indulge in magic and sorcery will after death when they have been tortured in the other courts be brought here to this court and dragged backwards by bull-headed horse-faced devils to be thrust into the great Gehenna. Then, when they have been tortured in the various wards, they will be passed on to the tenth court, whence, at the expiration of a kalpa, they will be sent back to earth, with changed heads and faces, for ever to find their place amongst the brute creation. But those who believe in the divine panorama, and on the first of the fourth moon make a vow of repentance, repeating the same every night and morning to the spirit of the hearth, shall, by virtue of one of three characters, obedient, acquiescent, or repentant, to be traced on their foreheads at death by the spirit of the hearth, escape half the punishments from the first to the seventh court inclusive, and escape this eighth court altogether, being passed on to the ninth court, where cases of arson and poisoning are investigated, and finally born again from the tenth court among mankind as before. To this God added, Whosoever may circulate the divine panorama for the information of the world at large shall escape all punishment from the first to the eighth court inclusive, passing through the ninth and tenth courts, they shall be born again amongst men in some happy state. The Ninth Court His Infernal Majesty, Ping Teng, reigns at the bottom of the great ocean, away to the southwest, below the Wu Chao Rock. His is the vast circular hell of A Pi, many leagues in breadth, jealously enclosed by an iron net and subdivided into sixteen wards as follows. In the first, the wicked souls have their bones beaten and their bodies scorched. In the second, their muscles are drawn out and their bones wrapped. In the third, ducks eat their heart and liver. In the fourth, dogs eat their intestines and lungs. In the fifth, they are splashed with hot oil. In the sixth, their heads are crushed in a frame, and their tongues and teeth are drawn out. In the seventh, their brains are taken out, and their skulls filled with hedgehogs. In the eighth, their heads are steamed, and their brains scraped. In the ninth, they are dragged about by sheep, till they drop to pieces. In the tenth, they are squeezed in a wooden press, and pricked on the head. In the eleventh, their hearts are ground in a mill. In the twelfth, boiling water drips onto their bodies. In the thirteenth, they are stung by wasps. In the fourteenth, they are tortured by ants and maggots. They are then stewed and finally wrung out like clothes. In the fifteenth, they are stung by scorpions. In the sixteenth, they are tortured by venomous snakes crimson and scarlet. All who on earth have committed one of the ten great crimes, and have deserved either the lingering death, decapitation, strangulation, or other punishment, shall, after passing through the tortures of the previous courts, be brought to this court, together with those guilty of arson, of making coup poison, bad books, 
stupefying drugs, and many other disgraceful acts. Then, if it be found that, hearkening to the words of the divine panorama, they subsequently destroyed the blocks of these books, burnt their prescriptions, and ceased practicing the magical art, they shall escape the punishments of this court, and be passed on to the tenth court, thence to be born again amongst the sons of men. But, if having heard the warnings of the divine panorama, they still continue to sin, from the second to the eighth court their tortures shall be increased. They shall be bound onto a hollow copper pillar, clasping it round with their hands and feet. Then the pillar shall be filled with fierce fire, so as to burn into their heart and liver, and afterwards their feet shall be plunged into the great Gehenna of Api. Knives shall be thrust into their lungs, they shall bite their own hearts, and gradually sink to the uttermost depths of hell, there to endure excruciating torments until the victims of their wickedness have either recovered the property out of which they were cheated, or the life that was taken away from them, and until every trace of book, prescription, picture, etc., formerly used by these wicked souls has disappeared from the face of the earth then and only then may they pass into the tenth court to be born again in one of the six states of existence o ye who have committed such crimes as these on the eighth of the fourth moon or the first or fifteenth of any moon fasting Swear that you will buy up all the bad books and magical pamphlets and utterly destroy them with fire, or that you will circulate copies of the divine panorama to be a warning to others. Then, when your last moment is at hand, the spirit of the hearth will write on your forehead the two words he obeyed, and from the second up to the ninth court your good deeds will be rewarded by a diminution of such punishments as you have incurred. People in the higher ranks of life who secure incendiaries or murderers, who destroy the blocks of bad books or publish notices warning others and offer rewards for the production of such books, will be rewarded by the success of their sons and grandsons at the public examinations. Poor people, who by a great effort manage to have the divine panorama circulated for the benefit of mankind, will be forwarded at once to the tenth court, and thence be born again in some happy state on earth. The Tenth Court His Infernal Majesty, Chuan Lun, reigns in the dark land due east, away below the Wu Chao Rock, just opposite the Wu Cho of this world. There he has six bridges of gold, silver, jade, stone, wood, and planks, over which all souls must pass. He examines the shades that are sent from the other courts, and according to their deserts, sends them back to earth as men, women, old, young, high, low, rich or poor, forwarding monthly, a list of their names to the judge of the first court for transmission to Feng Tu. The regulations provide that all beasts, birds, fishes, and insects, whether biped, quadruped, or otherwise, shall after death become Qian, to be born again for long and short lives alternately. But such as may possibly have taken life and such as must necessarily have taken life, will pass through a revolution of the wheel, and then, when their sins have been examined, they will be sent up on earth to receive the proper retribution. At the end of every year, a report will be forwarded to Feng Tu. Those scholars who study the Book of Changes, or priests who chant their liturgies, cannot be tortured in the ten courts for the sins they have committed. When they come to this court, their names and features are taken down in a book kept for the purpose, and they are forwarded to Mother Meng, who drives them on to the terrace of oblivion and doses them with a draught of forgetfulness. Then they are born again in the world for a day, a week, 
or it may be a year, when they die once more. And now, having forgotten the holy words of the three religions, they are carried off by devils to the various courts and are properly punished for their former crimes. All souls whose balance of good and evil is exact, whose period or whose crimes are many and good deeds few, as soon as their future state has been decided, man, woman, beautiful, ugly, comfort, toil, wealth, or poverty, as the case may be, must pass through the terrace of oblivion. Among those shades, on their way to be born again in the world of human beings, there are often to be found women who cry out that they have some old and bitter wrong to avenge, and that rather than be born again amongst men, they would prefer to enter the ranks of hungry devils. On examining them more closely, it generally comes out that they are the virtuous victims of some wicked student, who may perhaps have an eye to their money, and accordingly dresses himself out to entrap them, or promises marriage when sometimes he has a wife already, or offers to take care of an aged mother or a late husband's children. Thus the foolish women are beguiled, and put their property in the wicked man's hands. By and by he turns round and reviles them, and losing face in the eyes of their relatives and friends, with no one to redress their wrong, they are driven to commit suicide. Then, hearing that their seducer is likely to succeed at the examination, they beg and implore to be allowed to go back and compass his death. Now, although what they urge is true enough yet, that man's destiny may not be worked out, or the transmitted effects of his ancestor's virtue may not have passed away. Therefore, as a compromise, these injured shades are allowed to send a spirit to the examination hall to hinder and confuse him in the preparation of his paper, or to change the names of the published list of successful candidates. And finally, when his hour arrives, to proceed with the spirit who carries the death summons, seize him, and bring him to the first court of judgment. Ye who on the seventeenth of the fourth moon swear to carry out the precepts of the divine panorama, and frequently make those words the subject of your conversation, may in the life to come be born again amongst men and escape official punishments, fire, flood, and all accidents to the body. The place where the wheel of fate goes round is many leagues in extent, enclosed on all sides by an iron palisade. Within are eighty-one subdivisions, each of which has its proper officers and magisterial appointments. Beyond the palisade there is a labyrinth of a hundred and eight thousand paths, leading by direct and circuitous routes back to earth. Inside it is as dark as pitch, and through it pass the spirits of priest and layman alike. But to one who looks from the outside, everything is seen as clear as crystal, and the attendants who guard the place all have the faces and features they had at their birth. These attendants are chosen from virtuous people who in life were noted for filial piety, friendship, or respect for life and are sent here to look after the working of the wheel and such duties. If for a space of five years they make no mistakes, they are promoted to a higher office. But if found to be lazy or careless, they are reported to the throne for punishment. Those who in life have been unfilial or have destroyed much life when they have been tortured in the various courts, are brought here and beaten to death with peach twigs. They then become Chien, and with changed heads and altered faces, are turned out into the labyrinth to proceed by the path which ends in the brute creation. Birds, beasts, fishes, and insects may, after many myriads of kalpas, again resume their original shapes and if there are any that during three existences do not destroy life, they may be born amongst human beings as a reward. 
a record being made and their names forwarded to the first court for approval. But all shades of men and women must proceed to the terrace of oblivion. Mother Meng was born in the earlier Han Dynasty. In her childhood, she studied books of the Confucian school. When she grew up, she chanted the liturgies of Buddha. Of the past and the future, she had no care, but occupied herself in exhorting mankind to desist from taking life and become vegetarians. At 81 years of age, her hair was white and her complexion like a child's. She lived and died a virgin, calling herself simply Ming, but men called her Mother Ming. She retired to the hills and lived as a religious until the later Han. Then, because certain evildoers, relying on their knowledge of the past, used to beguile women by pretending to have been their husbands in a former life, God commissioned Mother Meng to build the Terrace of Oblivion, and appointed her as guardian, with devils to wait upon her and execute her commands. It was arranged that all shades who had been sentenced in the ten courts to return in various conditions to earth should first be dosed by her with a decoction of herbs, sweet, bitter, acrid, sour, or salt. Thus they forgot everything that has previously happened to them, and carry away with them to earth some slight weakness, such as the mouth watering at the thought of something nice, laughter-inducing perspiration, fear-inducing tears, anger-inducing sobs, or spitting from nervousness. Good spirits who go back into the world will have their senses of sight hearing, smell, and taste very much increased in power, and their physical strength and constitution generally will be much bettered. But evil spirits will experience the exact contrary of this as a reward for previous sins and as a warning to others to pray and repent. The terrace is situated in front of the ten courts, outside six bridges. It is square, measuring ten Chinese feet every way, and surrounded by a hundred and eight small rooms. To the east there is a raised path, one foot four inches in breadth, and in the rooms above mentioned are prepared cups of forgetfulness, ready for the arrival of the shades. Whether they swallow much or little, it matters not, but sometimes there are perverse devils who altogether refuse to drink, then beneath their feet sharp blades start up, and a copper tube is forced down their throats, by which means they are compelled to swallow some. When they have drunk, they are raised by the attendants and escorted back by the same path. They are next pushed onto the bitter bamboo floating bridge, with torrents of rushing red water on either side. Halfway across they perceive written in large characters on a red cliff on the opposite side the following lines. To be a man is easy, but to act up to one's responsibilities as such is hard. Yet to be a man once again is harder still. For those who would be born again in some happy state there is no great difficulty. It is only necessary to keep mouth and heart in harmony. When the shades have read these words, they try to jump on shore, but are beaten back into the water by two huge devils. One has on a black official hat and embroidered clothes. In his hand he holds a paper, pencil, and over his shoulder he carries a sharp sword. Instruments of torture hang at his waist. Fiercely he glares out of his large round eyes and laughs a horrid laugh. His name is Short Life. The other has a dirty face smeared with blood. He has on a white coat, an abacus in his hand, and a rice sack over his shoulder. Round his neck hangs a string of paper money. His brow contracts, 
hideously, and he utters long sighs. His name is They Have Their Reward, and his duty is to push the shades into the red water. The wicked and foolish rejoice at the prospect of being born once more as human beings. But the better shades weep and mourn that in life they did not lay up a store of virtuous acts and thus pass away from the state of mortals for ever. Yet they all rush on to birth like an infatuated or drunken crowd, and again in their early childhood hanker for the forbidden flavors. Then, regardless of consequences, they begin to destroy life and thus forfeit all claims to the mercy and compassion of God. They take no thought as to the end that must overtake them, and finally they bring themselves once more to the same horrid plight. End of Appendix A End of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2